All right, good evening, everybody. If you're like me, I can't wait to go see the Black Keys, so I'll make this painless as possible. Uh, welcome to Extreme Performance. We're going to talk about some applications that are uh, corner cases. We're not generally going to talk about stuff that behaves well. Uh, we're going to talk about applications that generally might require a violation of best practices. So extra tender love and care for those sorts of applications. Uh, my name is Vishnu Mohan. I work in the professional services wing of VMware. I'm embedded with customers as an architect. Um, I typically tend to focus on quite a few performance problems raised in the field and then relay that back to folks like Reza, who works in engineering. Hi, uh, I'm Reza Tahari. As Vishnu said, I work in the, the uh, organization that develops vSphere. I'm part of a group of about 80 to 90 engineers whose sole focus is on performance and on tuning and optimizing the performance of the core vSphere product. Uh, as Vishnu said, this is an unusual talk for VMworld. Usually, uh, we stand up here and tell you how great everything is and how everything is working well. Uh, this topic uh, is probably more suited for like an academic conference where we are talking about some very interesting corner cases where you want to sit down and analyze some things that are not working well and why they aren't working well. Uh, and get to the root cause of it. Uh, so you've got to juxtapose those two. All right, this is a standard disclaimer. I'm not going to bore you with it. You've seen it at every talk that we've been to. But let's start off with the state of affairs, right? So today, all business critical applications that we're aware of, most of them run really well on vSphere. And this is what this slide is trying to illustrate. Most of our customers are running Exchange, SQL, SharePoint, um, these are the top three, at least with 50% or more of their workloads being virtualized today. Um, Oracle and SAP are also catching up. So this is typically what most of our customers consider business critical, really high performance requirement applications. And we're trying to tell you that, yes, you can run all of these workloads really well, and you won't run into any trouble as long as you're running the latest versions of vSphere, have all the patches applied, followed really good engineering advice, and you should not run into any, run into any issues. A history lesson for those of you who have ever used ESX1, very few of you, I imagine. We only had one vCPU support when it first came out, two gigs of RAM, very small, very tiny VMs that we could ever run on ESX. Through the years, we've added two vCPUs. The first release to have SMP was ESX2. Building on that, we added four vCPUs and a pretty decent milestone, 64 gigabytes per VM. Um, and IOPS started to stretch into the hundreds of thousands. With vSphere 4, we went up to eight vCPUs and arguably yet another important limit, two to six gigabytes of memory per VM. And we could do 300,000 IOPS. But vSphere 5 actually kind of made a quantum leap in that we went from eight to 64 vCPUs. We went to a terabyte of memory in a single VM. We can actually push greater than 40 gigabits of throughput from a single ESX host. And we can also do one million IOPS from a single VM. Previous results have shown uh, vSphere 5.0 was, you, you could hit this number with vSphere 5.0, the 1 million IOPS, but we had to use multiple VMs to do it. vSphere 5.5 was one of the first releases where we could actually do this from just a single VM. So this goes to show that you know, we can actually handle pretty intense workloads on vSphere today. Yeah, and this next one uh, is one that, again, it's sort of a state of affairs where we are now is one that I'm particularly proud of because I was associated with it. And uh, we worked with a partner to disclose results on an industry standard benchmark with a third party independent auditor with a very long uh, audit report that you can look at and get all the details. Why this is interesting and why this is relevant to this talk is that when you look at the native result on the same benchmark, uh, we got 1,416 transactions per second. Now, this is a benchmark that runs on SQL Server. It's extremely high demanding. It uses all the CPU to full saturation. It beats on the memory. It also has very high I.O. storage I.O. requirements, about 120,000 IOPS. It also has very high networking requirements. And despite all of these, when we, we can excel in all of these uh, axes and achieve a performance that's only about a percent and a half off of native. Okay. So the key here is that with a normal 
even though high demanding, but not a corner case application where you have nowhere to hide, you use all the CPU, all the memory, lots of I.O., lots of networking, you can still have good performance. But there are cases where that's not the case, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, in doing all of our research, we went and asked a bunch of customers, or we found problems in customers. We also went and rattled the cages of the engineering folks, and we asked them for, hey, what's broken? or what really is one of those corner cases. And we, we found that we could put them broadly into five categories. So the first one is IO intensive applications. Everybody knows this. Everybody typically says, oh, you really can't run really high intensive IO intensive applications on vSphere. Uh, there are caveats, but for the most part, we can. And we'll talk about the corner cases with respect to bandwidth heavy applications and also latency sensitive applications. The next category is the ones that require uh, or incur a very high overhead when it comes to memory address translations. In order to run a virtual machine, there's an additional tier of memory address translations, that from the virtual machine address space down to the physical machine's address space. And that can sometime, uh, sometimes be a source of uh, high overhead and in a corner case scenario. We also talk about applications that demonstrate a high rate of sleep and wake up. So if you have applications that are multi-threaded and also are sort of broadly fit into the producer-consumer category, so you usually have a thread that spins on one CPU producing data, and you have a thread on another CPU consuming that data as soon as it arrives. In certain situations, we've noticed that this can be a very, very bad uh, uh, use case for virtualization, but we also provide some workarounds in that space. For completeness sake, we're also going to talk a little bit about timer applications, or applications that require uh, a lot from the timer in terms of their request rates for get time of day, for instance, are really high. Um, we've sort of addressed most of them, but we're just going to talk about it for completeness' sake, in case your application runs into that. And finally, we're going to talk about latency-sensitive applications, which is what we've worked on tremendously uh, ever since the 4.0 releases. We started to notice customers wanting to run a lot of low-latency workloads on their virtual machines, and we said, okay, we can't really do that today, and we're going to try and fix this as, you know, we have future releases, and it's really come around in VCO 5.5, so we'll get into some of those details there. We're also going to tell you what we can do to, you know, despite the fact if you're running into these situations where you do have these sorts of applications, what's the best you can do? How can you uh, tune these? And also, uh, we want to highlight, more importantly, that you, know, you really need a lot of good engineering common sense when, you come, when it comes to like, sizing these workloads and deploying them. Sometimes the bottleneck might not even be ESX. It might be somewhere deep down in your storage layer, your networking layer, or even in firmware. Things that are completely out of the control of ESX. So we want to make sure that you know we're not going to dwell too much on that, but these can also have an impact on these really high performance requirements. And we also talk about uh, these remaining challenges. Some of these challenges that we're going to talk about are fundamental. Regardless of the fact you run on KVM or Hyper-V or VMware today, you're probably going to run into these situations. And there's not really a very good story around them for some of it, but things are getting better with the cooperation of silicon and, and other things that we're doing on our stacks as well. So uh, all of this data, like I mentioned, was collected from customers. It was also from in-house performance testing. Um, it was also things that we were caught off by, well, caught off guard, really. Um, it's still a work in progress, like we mentioned. There's no real, really good answer for your best performance. If you want 100% of native, this is probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, and again, we're only going to focus on ESX itself. We're not going to talk about vSAN or NSX or any of the performance issues associated with any of those other stacks. We're just going to focus on core vSphere for now. Um, we're also not going to look at vSphere bugs, although we will talk about some of the bugs that actually surfaced and made our problems a little harder to solve. Uh, but in generally, you know, these issues are going to be present on every, any hypervisor, and it's a qualitative analysis. So it's kind of fuzzy. I mean, we, don't, we have numbers, but at the same time, the interpretation of those numbers can be a little uh, distracting. OK, so let's not talk about things like bad engineering practices. You created a whole bunch of VMs and put them on one spindle. That's not what we're here to talk about. We also want you to, to we also assume that you're running the latest versions of vCF 5.5, using the latest power virtual drivers, so on and so forth. You also followed the best practices available for each of our products. And again, really want to stress this, like always do apples to apples comparisons, you know, make sure that what you're really benchmarking is ultimately a real virtualization problem. It's pretty hard to narrow it down, but if it is the case, then this talk is going to be useful to you. 
Uh, VCO bugs that have already been reported, we're going to dwell on them for just a little bit because it does affect us sometimes. But for the most part, the releases that we are talking about have them fixed. Um, and then even if we do make all of these recommendations, if the performance is acceptable, and the definition of acceptance varies from customer to customer, we want to highlight that there's still fundamental problems with virtualization. This is not going away anytime soon. Or hopefully, it will, but we'll see. All right, so the first category of uh, applications uh, that we're going to talk about is IOPS, uh, or IO intensive applications. So we have demonstrated, and this is on VCO 5.1, that we can actually do 1 million IOPS from one VM. And this is the configuration. There's a blog article about this. This has been around for a while. What we tend to brush under the carpet is that in order to achieve this, we had to consume tremendous amounts of CPU. Even though this VM is only saying it's, it's got what? Um, it's um, eight. eight vCPUs and 48 gigs of RAM. It actually practically ended up, ended up chewing all of the, the CPU capacity on that box in order to deliver this sort of performance. So that's something we'll get into. And on the networking side, we can actually saturate uh, 10 gigabit NICs today in terms of bandwidth. In terms of millions of packets per second, we're kind of doing all right. We can do a million packets per second today per NIC, but we're trying to improve that. That said, we are saturating. So theoretically, if you have a 10 gigabit NIC, you can at most at the standard MTU size of 1,500, you can only push 9.4 gigabits per second. And this number lines up right there. So we're actually getting the most we can, theoretically, out of a NIC today. So let's talk about the 1 million disk IOPS issue. OK, so um, as Vishnu said, we have put out a, a blog that shows we can do 1 million IOPS. That's a big number. I doubt any of you in your day-to-day -day work will get anywhere near that or even close to an order of magnitude near that. But in order to make sure that your 10,000 IOPS application works well, we push the system to a million IOPS. We can do this, and you probably can't even do it in your shop. It's going to take a few knobs to turn, but not too many. But what we are talking about here is that on any hypervisor, this has a cost. You may have heard of going through the stack twice. So when you issue an I.O., you go through the guests, driver, and the operating system, and then the I.O. is issued, but not really. You have to go through the host and actually issue it. So you go through that twice. Network inside, you go through the TCP stack perhaps twice. So there is a cost associated with that. And if you look at, uh, if you just sit there and measure, and we have sat and carefully measured how, how many CPU cycles it takes to issue and complete a storage I.O. request, it's about 44 microseconds. You do the math, a million of these times 44 microseconds, that's 44 cores. Well, we didn't really use that much. Uh, we have tuned the system through uh, a lot of aggregation and coalescing and economies of scale to use a lot less than that. But still, it's not free. Virtualization adds an overhead. And that overhead, if you look at the 1 million IOP system, we had an 8 virtual CPU uh, VM that was maxed out. And also, there were about eight or nine other cores that were busy running the auxiliary kernel, VM kernel threads. So there was a cost of about 16 cores total to do a million IOs. Eight of it on the GIS, which is probably what you would find on your native system too, and the rest on VM kernel. So there is a, there is a cost associated with that. On the networking side, in general, we have done better. We have done better because the demands of networking, both in terms of packets per second and in terms of latency that we're going to talk about later, have been more stringent all along than storage I.O. Plus, we have uh, hardware assist in the NICs to do some of the work that you would normally have the processor do. As a result, the cost is less. We have been able to do uh, uh, a million uh, packets per second easily on 5.5 .5 out of 1 VM. And the uh, graph that we showed earlier, we were doing 8 million packets per second from all the VMs. Uh, to do that for 1 million IOPS, uh, when actually we think we're measuring in the lab approaching 4 million 
packets per second for the next release. And that is taking up uh, somewhere around four cores on the receive side, and the send side is even better than that. And when you, if you do the math, the mental math, you see that's almost an order of magnitude better than how we, how we are doing on the storage side. So that, uh, that cost is less, but it is still there. And that's fundamental to virtualization. So in general, uh, to handle high IOPS or high networking packets per second, uh, you have to tune for it, right? It, virtualization adds a layer. If you are working on a physical system, you have to tune your app, you have to tune your OS, tune your configuration, tune your array, make sure everything is configured well to do lots of IOS per second. Well, here you add one more layer, you gotta make sure that's tuned well and optimized well. Use best, best practices, etc. cetera. Um, Texas MTLC has the application and the guest OS. And uh, there is still some cost associated with that. And if you do capacity planning, and if you do a lot of IOs, networking or storage, you gotta take that into consideration when you do your capacity planning. We have other tools available. Uh, we listed this almost mostly to tell you sort of, you shouldn't have to do it. There is pass through. And we often hear customers saying, oh, I have a problem, I have an IO problem. You're gonna do pass through. You shouldn't need that. We didn't need pass-through to do one million IOPS. You shouldn't need pass-through, what do we call it, direct path. SRIO, uh, fixed pass-through. Or SRIOV for 10, 100,000 IOPS, okay? But those tools are there if somebody really has to use it. Or RDM, uh, it gives you a couple of percent better performance, but you lose a lot of the goodness of virtualization. You shouldn't have to do it. And go ahead. So let's get to the latency discussion. We talked about the bandwidth, the bandwidth rather, but now let's talk about the latency equation. So for that test that we talked about, where we did one million IOPS per second against a VMAX in this particular instance, we were still just a little over two milliseconds, which is really great response times for that kind of workload. So you can see that the number almost linearly scales, which is a great, uh, you know, scaling criterion, and also the performance seems to be pretty awesome. We're still doing sub, you know, around two milliseconds. Like people tend to worry when you go to like tens or 15 milliseconds. That's really when you start seeing performance issues inside your application. So this just goes to show that even on spinning Rust, we do pretty well. The problem, unfortunately, which has caught the entire industry off guard, any OS vendor will admit this to you, is that we have seen an evolution of access times dropping so rapidly with the advent of SSD devices that the storage stack has not been able to factor this in and keep up with it. So what does this really mean? So today we see typically ac typical access times in tens of microseconds. And even in the nanosecond territory for phase change memory, as you can see here, we also have some really crazy technologies like memory channel storage or the stuff that's coming out from Diablo, for instance. So we're really trying to figure out how to handle all of these sorts of new storage devices well. And the problem is our storage stacks are so antiquated that we haven't managed to like, you know, retrofit it to be able to handle these sorts of um, new storage devices. And the problem here is that you can see that this is just tens of microseconds. The problem is that vSphere's overhead to process an IO is also now in the tens of microsecond. So if you add these two up, the dominant overhead starts to become vSphere. So if you have you know, these really fast storage devices, and if you compare them to bare metal benchmarks, you're gonna find 40% uh, overhead. So you're gonna be 40% you know, worse than, than bare metal. And it's only because of this, it's physics. There's nothing, there's no getting around our overhead at the moment, it's, which is in the tens of microseconds. And if you have these devices, you're going to see a 40% hit. And if your application really stands to benefit from these sorts of workloads, or from these sorts of devices, sorry, vSphere is not a good fit here today. So this is how we actually ran into this issue, right? So I work at, you know, in the field, like I mentioned, and so a customer came to me and said, hey, I'm running all of my storage on a NAS, on an NFS device, on a NetApp, and I'm seeing a 40% penalty compared to the same workload that I ran on native. It turned out that the NetApp was actually backing all of the IO with an SSD, you know, tiered storage. And so the overhead was a lot higher. Those tens of microseconds per IO added up. And we were seeing 
because vSphere's uh, overhead itself dominated that workload's overhead. So let's talk about database log IO, which is a very interesting use case that Reza discovered. Yeah, so this is another corner case that you may run into, and if you do, it's going to take extra TLC on your part to deal with. So databases in general, uh, this pointer works. So uh, typically with spinning disks, right? These are not SSDs with 10 microsecond latencies. These are your normal old-fashioned spinning disks. Your data disks typically have latencies in milliseconds, usually 5 plus, 10, usually when you get to 15, it's too slow. It happens because you have random I.O. patterns, you have a lot of seeking, a lot of different threads of execution beating on the same drive. So the kind of latency you get in many milliseconds, so we add an extra 10, 20, 30 microseconds. Nobody notices that, no problems. The redo log, however, is different. Uh, it's typically on its own disk drive. A good DBA doesn't mix his or her log and data. You put the log on its own drive, typically. It's a sequential I.O. pattern. Not a lot of IOPS, maybe a 1,000 would be high. Single threaded, your log writer is writing to it, and it's write only. And as a result, if you have a battery-backed cache in front of it on the disk drive or the array, or sometimes even on the controller on the host, those writes get immediately acknowledged. You get a very quick response time. So what you have is a combination of two things. One, you have a very fast response time for a spinning disk. And two, you have a redo log. And if you look at your, for example, Oracle AWR reports, your log file sync time is typically one of your top five events. So this is really important. Your database is sensitive to this latency. Uh, so we can't hide if there is any noticeable additional latency on that when you, when you virtualize. Okay. So what we have to do is that this is a case where you sort of have to go against what ESX tries to do to optimize performance, which is aggregate and coalesce for good CPU cycles per I.O. at the expense of some latency. You want to reverse that. You want to say, no, I want the best latency. I don't care what the CPU cost is. It's only 1,000 I.O.s per second, so that's fine. Uh, one of the ways that we do this aggregation is on the issuing path, as many I.O.s are generated by the guest, we wait and batch a bunch of them up before the VM kernel picks them up and it starts issuing them to the actual disk. Uh, what you would want to do for a redo log is to actually defeat that. So you want to issue the IOs, initiate them immediately. So the way you would do it is, for now, we have to admit, uh, don't tell anybody, but this is, this particular tunable is broken for PV SCSI. So you would have to use an LSI logic, uh, uh, the virtual HBA, and then set the async parameter to false. So do not issue in an asynchronous manner. So when an I.O. is issued by the guest, immediately pick it up and run with it so we get the best latency. There's a couple of other ways that uh, you can do it. And thankfully, in the next release, uh, this is going to be fixed for PV SCSI, so you could force it, but you shouldn't even need it in the next release. It will dynamically deal with it, adjust to it, so you shouldn't even have to deal with it um, in the upcoming release. But right now, if you really care about your redo log, put on LSI logic and uh, set the async to false. That was on the issuing path. We also try to coalesce on the completion path. So, the virtual interrupts that are delivered to the guest OS, we try to coalesce them as much as we can. Now, one thing that ESX does is it automatically detects how much I.O. you are doing. If you are doing lots of I.O., it says, okay, let me collect like 10, 20 of them and then issue an interrupt. But then it, if it senses dynamically that, hey, this is trickle I.O., I get an I.O. every you know, few milliseconds and there is not a high I.O. rate, then it tries to deliver those interrupts immediately. The problem arises if you put your 
data and log virtual devices on the same virtual bus. In which case, you are doing a lot of data I.O. So ESX looks and says, oh, gee, there's a lot of I.O. going on on this bus, so I better start coalescing them. And then these log I.O.s get held up for the coalescing, and you pay price on uh, latency. So you have to defeat that. Uh, one thing you can do is put the log device on a VHBI by itself. If the device is on a bus by itself, ESX detects a trickle I.O., issues interrupts immediately, no problem. But if you really have to put your log and data on the same bus and you care about your log latency, perhaps you can do the trade-off. Give up some CPU, get your latency back by explicitly turning off and disabling interrupt coalescing. Okay, again, it's a corner case, but it could happen. So. It's an issue on all hypervisors. It's a kind of a class problem we have been looking for. Uh, and it's going to become more and more noticeable as uh, SSD latencies go down. Uh, again, you may not, but even if it happens to you, you may not notice it depending on how sensitive the end user response time is to this. Uh, and here is an example where uh, this is pretty much the biggest hammer that we have. We beat on ESX running a transaction processing system on a database, full force going full bore on the, on the server. And we still see, when we do the tuning that we told you guys by disabling aggregation and coalescing, we match the native latency. Well, okay, so maybe on native is point, 0 0.4, on virtual is 0 0.402 or something, but good enough, close enough. But when we really push it, we get to the point that we see an increase in the redo log latency with Oracle on a 32-way. And you know that, if you're running on a single VM, that may make you leave some performance on the table. You have some idle left. So it's something to, to, to look at. Uh, and there is, again, all passed through, but you shouldn't have to need use it if you do the uh, tuning that we told you about, you should be able to, to handle it. Uh, and uh, on the networking side, as we said, latency has been an issue, but because it's been an issue for longer and we have done more work on it and there is more hardware assets av available, it hasn't been as much of a problem. And we're gonna come back at the end of the talk and talk about the latency sensitive applications from the networking side again. All right, so this is, the, uh, this is a portion of the talk that is going to test how awake you guys are. This is when we get really into some very deep technical stuff uh, that you would normally, again, see at an academic conference. So we're going to talk about memory and virtual memory. And virtual is a word that's overloaded here, uh, unfortunately. We're not talking about virtualization yet. We're just talking about virtual memory on an OS. So this is you know, what you learned uh, when, like when I was going to school in the 70s, what we learned, and you guys, most of you in the, you know, in the past 10 years, you have virtual memory, you have your guest OS, it does translation, it translates to physical address, and then you have this thing called a transaction look aside buffer that does this translation from virtual to physical on the fly. For every memory access, you get the translation. It's cached, no problem. Well, it only can cache so many of these translations. If you have more pages that you're juggling, you're gonna have misses. When you have a miss on the TLB, you throw, you evict somebody and bring a new translation in, and you do it by going through a page table walk, going through the page tables, bringing a translation in, putting it in a TLB, and off you go. No problem. Well, virtualization uh, throws a wrinkle in here. The guest has a virtual address. The guest has a physical address, but that's just you know, imaginary. The data really results, resides in a page that the hypervisor knows about, and we call this the machine address. So in the old days, what we would do is uh, we would have this concept called the software MMU, or also referred to as shadow page tables. Uh, 
If you go look at academic papers, uh, you're going to see stuff about this. And the way this worked was that uh, the, let's see, is it the next slide? Yeah, so you can see this red line here. So the guest has a translation from uh, physical to virtual. And that, uh, I'm from blah, 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 virtual to physical. And that vi the physical address is really mapped to a machine address. There's a shadow page table on the side that the hypervisor maintains that directly maps the virtual address from the guest to the machine address. So when there's a TLB mess, we stuff an address in there into the hardware, and it actually goes and looks at our page table and gets a translation and puts it in the TLB. So everything is hunky-dory. Well, not so hunky-dory because that's really hard to maintain. Uh, our engineers quite often say, when can we get rid of this? You know, they just go and use, uh, use hardware. And about five, six years ago, Intel and AMD both came out with assist for uh, virtual memory. It's been a boon for us. It works really well. So what we do is we tell the hardware, the, the processor knows about the guests virtual to physical mapping and then we supply mapping from those physical addresses to real machine addresses. And so when there is a TLB miss, the processor does this two-dimensional page block. It says, okay, I got these page tables and I got these. Okay, I'm gonna go th through them and actually for every translation uh, on one, um, one of, on the, from virtual to physical, it goes through multiple translations here. You can read about it in, in papers, but it, it works and it works well. Well, how well does it work? So uh, it gets rid of uh, the exits, VM exits, which are a really expensive operation in virtualization. Wonderful. And uh, we don't have those shadow page tables. There is no overhead in that involved. And it made our lives, the engineers' lives, easier to develop our you know, wider VMs. OK, so is there a downside? Well, yeah. The downside is TLB misses are more expensive. When you're missing the TLB, in the old days, you would go get one translation from a page, stuff it. Now you have these two page tables, multiple levels of each, and you have to go through, if you have four levels here, four levels here, you have to go through 16 steps. It becomes expensive. Okay. So what is the, what's the trade-off? What's the balance here? Well, it's been wonderful for us. Uh, hardware assist is much cheaper. And as an example, uh, this is sort of the poster child for the case where hardware assist helps. If you're compiling something, you have a lot of processes that are generated and then they go away, you mess with the page tables in the, uh, in the guest, that's expensive. The, uh, the hardware takes care of all of this. The performance of compiling Apache has doubled, right? The hardware is great. And what's interesting is that even for something like this workload, when we, it's an OLTP workload, static processes, very high TLB miss rate, that's a poster child for the case where the TLB miss costs might hurt you. Even in that case, the hardware assist EPT is 3% faster. So from twice as fast to 3% faster for the worst case, that's great. You're done. Or maybe not. Well, so not so fast, right? So uh, another customer was running an application, very large Java application, as you can see. It had 62 gigabytes of heap allocated to it. Um, what we found with this application was it exhibited a pretty, pretty bad drop in performance. So it was 30 to 40 percent worse than physical. So the same Java application, when run on physical, was 30 to 40 percent faster. And so we looked at a whole bunch of things, and we noticed that the DTLB, so the data translation looks like buffer, there was the miss rates on that were really, really high. We can measure this with a tool called Perf, or with uh, ESX, you can measure it with the tool called VMK Perf. So Perf is like a little, you know, D-trace equivalent on Linux, if you're familiar with it. So we looked at these numbers, right? And they were mind-boggling. We have not seen numbers like this in, in the field. 
or even in engineering really. So 18 million misses per second per core at peak. It's in, it's, we haven't heard of it. And on average, it was still pretty high. It was 13 million per second per core. So this is a real corner case. Like we haven't seen anything like this. And the problem here is, like we mentioned, was an order of n squared cost to process a DTLD miss. So this overhead added up pretty quickly. So we found using those tools that we spent an average of 16% just waiting for the hardware to give us a reply. What does this physical address map to, or what does the virtual address map to in the physical space? So this was consuming quite a lot, but there's also a bunch of indirect costs. Therefore, you see this you know, adding up really quickly, and it was peaking, for 27%, peaking at 27% for several minutes. So what we did was, you know, like, okay, maybe let's try turning off the hardware TLB. Technically, that's against all of our best practices recommendations. They tried everything. They even used large pages, as you would for a very large Java application. So they tried everything. They followed all of the directions that we had in the book. And then when they switched back to the software MMU, and you know, we thought the overhead was going to be worse, it actually narrowed it down to 17% of native, and they were more than happy to virtualize this app. So what is the story here? Very few applications will ever exhibit this in the field. In fact, this was the only application that we ran into talking to many, many customers, running really intense Java applications, that we saw this sort of behavior. And it's definitely one of those corner cases for the software MMU. So the only way to really fix this is if the DTLB grows larger, or the TLB itself grows larger. So what that means is we need more silicon space on all of these chips, some from Intel and AMD, to order, in order to actually be able to capture the working set size of such a large VM. There's also limits with that. Like with any caching layer, there's going to be a miss at some point. But where's that cost-benefit analysis? So how do you even check for this? Like we said, if you use what we call the VPMC setting, so if you enable the virtual performance management counters, uh, the CPU counters directly up to the guest, which you can do with newer versions of ESX, you can just run perf. And you will see this. All you have to do is run perf stat, and it'll tell you your DTLB miss rates are really, really large. They're dominating pretty much all of your, your overhead. You can also use VMK Perf if you choose to become familiar with it. There's documentation out there. It's available on every newer release of ESX, I want to say with the 5.x releases. And again, we don't want you to use this for everything, right? So only use this when you run into this corner case. You have enough data to back that decision up. And you know, in, the, in all of the cases, just use the hardware MMU. It's probably going to be faster. Use large pages. Use the hardware MMU. You're probably going to be well served. OK, so let's talk about another class of applications. So we have really high rates of sleep and wake up. So what this really means is that we have these two threads, like I mentioned earlier, one that's producing data, one that's consuming data, sitting on two different cores. So it's typically like a ping pong, right? We're waiting for data going back and forth between the cores. And usually, the, the, the thread that's waiting for data, the, the consumer, is usually put to sleep. And while the native thread sleeps, like the OS has to like, figure out, OK, there's data for it to process, so let's wake it up. Right? How does the OS do this on native? On native, we use a set of instructions called the monitor mWait instruction set. It's actually available with SSC3. So this is a very efficient technique. So we don't actually have to spin and wait forever. Like Spinning is very expensive because it keeps the core really busy, very poor consolidation for you if you care about that. And also, it consumes a lot of energy. So you're actually wasting a lot more electricity if you did the whole you know, naive spinning approach. So monitor m -weight essentially is optimizing that by saying, if something writes to a particular location memory, I immediately know that I need to wake up that core. So it's a very efficient method. And also saves you a lot of, uh, a lot of um, power and CPU utilization. On virtual, unfortunately, for these sorts of applications, we don't virtualize the mWait instruction always. There are some efforts by KVM to try and virtualize this. We also have internal efforts to try and use the mWait instruction wherever it makes sense. But it's a very hard instruction to virtualize in general. So what do we resort to? We actually resort to what we call a rescheduling interrupt. So a rescheduling interrupt is a really kludgy way of doing this. So basically, what the producer core does is it has to issue what we call an interprocessor interrupt. So the interprocessor interrupt is sent to the thread that's sitting on that core waiting to process it that's actually idle and says, wake up. There's work for you to do. This res interrupt translating into the IPI is incredibly expensive. It takes a long time for this thing to actually work. So we want to avoid this wherever possible. And like I said, this can be observed on any hypervisor. If you're running KVM or ESX, all of them have this fundamental problem. They really can't virtualize monitor and mWait really well. So 
what do we do? So how did this problem present itself? So this was really pathologically bad. Like it was one sixth the performance of native. And you know, as you can expect, the customer is livid. Like what is going on? Um, so it, our initial triage, so when we actually looked at this problem, we were like, oh, let's go through all the performance best practices. And sure enough, we ran into this corner case where there's this facility on newer chips called supervisor mode execution prevention. It's really to do exploit mitigation. So it like protects your pages and stuff like that. So we had a bad implementation of some of this, or using this feature, we had a bad implementation that we fixed. So that's outlined in the KB. Just enabling that workaround or applying the patch gave us three to four times more uh, be better performance. Three to four times times one six is really not much. So it wasn't good enough for our customer. It's learned half you know, as native. So we also noticed we ran into flex priority. So flex priority is another feature that's typically turned off because of a CPU bug. So this is actually a problem with Intel CPUs. So unless you apply a microcode fix, Flex priority by default is disabled. Flex priority enables you to do things like virtualized interrupts much better and access to the TPR register if you like, if you care about this. Uh, Windows 32-bit really cares about this, so your Windows 32-bit 32 32 performance would have sucked unless you had this enabled. Um, so we found that, and we was like, okay, we had the CPU microcode bug fix applied, and that improved it by another 4x. Still not good enough because it was only. 17%? And we'll get to this in a bit. So here's what we did, right? So we applied that SMEP workaround. We enabled the flex priority workaround. And yeah, it was only 70% of native. That's the best we could achieve for this sort of workload. So if you run into this, and again, to trigger it is a really, really hard, it's really hard to trigger it. In fact, we couldn't even get a synthetic workload that would actually emulate this. In fact, we had to ship the application completely over to our labs to say, OK, this is really a problem, and we can instrument it and try to troubleshoot it. It's really hard to simulate, and we'll get into some of the conditions. So how do we work around this? Let's try and avoid this IPI process, right? How do we do that? We can do idle equals poll. So if you have a Linux guest, you can boot it with this parameter saying idle equals poll. What this does is actually goes back to that method of spinning on everything. Let's just spin, spin, spin forever, which is awesome if you don't care about electricity or you don't care about CPU usage. I think customers do, right? So this is very expensive, but it does give you performance on par with native. That's awesome, except your consolidation ratios are going to plummet. And also, it was very expensive in terms of power. There's a workaround, a sort of kludgy workaround. Why don't we co-locate the producer and the consumer thread on the same CPU? Sounds like a good idea, because you don't have to go through the sleep wake up, because they're all active. As soon as the data is ready, the thread can just do its work. The problem is you're not artificially limiting yourself to the CPU processing power of one core. So that's not really interesting for us as well. So if you're willing to sacrifice and use idle equals poll, you can get native. But with everything else applied, you're still going to hit about 70% of native, just so you know. It's very hard to trigger, as it's talking about. The producer and con consumer threads must do nothing but communicate, and everything else is practically idle on that box. So it's sort of synthetic, but you know, some people really have an application that does behave this way. And if there's no change that you can make to the guest OS itself, you're still going to see this problem. It's not going to go, go away anytime soon. Banging on the timer, this is, again, like I said, for completeness' sake. There's been extensive documentation on timekeeping. You can read all the KB articles. Just Google timekeeping with VMware. It'll talk about how you can do it for Windows, how to do it for Linux, and some other guest OSs that you might care about. Um, but in general, it's a very well-known problem. It's, it, it shows up on all hypervisors. So if you run KVM or ESX or Hyper-V, timekeeping in general is just incredibly hard. And some, some applications really need a high rate of timer interrupt delivery. So if you do a plenty of get time of day calls or reading from the TSC, the timestamp counter, you're going to run into this problem. Databases tend to love doing this a lot because they timestamp quite frequently. So if you run into this sort of issue, there's a few workarounds with Linux. Windows, not so much, because once you use the multimedia timer on Windows, it really just rockets up to a kilohertz, 1024 actually. So you have kilohertz interrupts. So the problem with VMware, or timekeeping in general, is that in order to deliver an interrupt rate of around 1,000 interrupts per second, it actually depends on the total number of CPUs that you have. So it's n plus 1, where n is the number of CPUs. So say you had two vCPUs and you needed 1,000 interrupts per second, we actually have to deliver 3,000 interrupts per second, or process 3,000 interrupts per second. If you had four vCPUs, it's 5,000 interrupts per second. And that overhead adds up really, really quickly. Um, 
Uh, there was also like problems with ESX itself. Earlier on, we were poll driven in order to be able to deliver this intrap. We're now intrap driven, which is actually a little more uh, efficient. Uh, and in general, most applications should not have this if you're running newer versions of the Linux kernel. Windows is the only outlier. So let's talk about that, right? So we have made, VMware has actually published quite a few patches to the Linux kernel and the timekeeping code, especially with tickless timers, to actually handle this sort of situation really well. There's like really good uh, performance that you can get now if you're running Windows. The only problem is Windows is still mm, not really there yet. And reading TSC is expensive. Another interesting corner case that we don't typically like mention in any of these KB articles is that when you do a vMotion, you might actually have a performance issue with get time of day. And the reason for this is different, if you have, especially if you have CPUs of different frequencies in your cluster. If they're all homogenous, you might not run into this, except in a corner case when you're using like different uh, C states, so different rates of frequency being applied to the, cert, to the CPU. So if you migrate a VM from, a, a, so from say X megahertz to Y megahertz, the delta from X and Y, during that time when we try to spin up to match the original CPU speed on the VM, we're going to do a VM exit. And like we said, VM exit is a bad word in virtualization. Every time that you see VM exit, just run, because it's, it's really expensive. So we try to avoid that as much as we can. But in these situations, unfortunately, every time we do a timer, a get time of day request, we have to do a VM exit to give you the correct time into the VM. It's very expensive. Um, when the frequencies are close, like it's a small gap, instead of like a big gap, say 1,000 megahertz or 2,000 megahertz, it's a small gap. We actually don't do this as badly. We only do it uh, occasionally, and only when you do a get time of day call. So if you don't do a get time of day call, all is great, but most applications, you know, if they're going to do a get time of day constantly, they're going to do this on a regular interval. AMD avoids this, so CPU vendors have come to our rescue, but unfortunately we have yet to take, care of, uh, take advantage of it, so that's something that we're trying to fix on our end. So just be aware that you know, this might, might be an issue for you. And finally, we talk about latency sensitive applications. So um, this, is, this is near and dear to my heart. I mean, so we actually have a, bunch of, a lot of customers working in finance that really care about this. Um, so they started complaining about this back in ESX 4.x days. So 4.1 really was OK, but it kind of sucked um, when it came to supporting these sorts of latency sensitive applications. And we worked with the uh, folks on Reza's team um, saying that, hey, we really need to like, try and get these sorts of applications fixed. Because one, it, it enables not only our customers, but in general, it improves our stack tremendously. Because we'll be finding uh, areas and accidental bugs or just uh, inefficient ways of handling I.O. So with VCO 5.5, um, this is a tremendous result that Reza would like to talk about. Yeah. yeah, so this is the last topic we're going to cover. Uh, so this is an interesting one because, uh, as Vishnu said, we, it's pretty much fixed. Yet I think it bears mention here, uh, both in terms of what you need to do. So it, it is one that requires TLC. So you need to do certain things to get the good latency. And also there may still be cases where it's not good enough or maybe too good, as I'm going to talk about. So what's interesting about latency-sensitive applications is that they don't just care about the median or mean latency. Jitter matters. If you have a very long tail and the tail is longer on virtual than on native, that's an issue. So if you look at this, uh, this bottom uh, curve, this bottom line, is the latency for native and uh, from, uh, all the way from median to 99.99 .99 percentile. And this is how ESX used to be. The median performance latency was twice as long as native. And it got worse as you went towards the long tail. Uh, even using uh, SRIOB, which is a way of basically doing uh, a more polite version of uh, uh, direct path or pass through, uh, we still had problems both in terms of the, the latency itself and also what happens at the end. With the latest features that we introduced in 5.1, you can see that not only do we have latency that is close to native, but stays close all the way to the end. Okay, so that's wonderful. All right, so again, this is a class issue. Any hypervisor has to go through their stack twice, and that adds to latency. So with um, 
uh, with ESX, we have this feature. It's called latency sensitive or, or high, 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 sensitivity, high sensitivity. High sensitivity or latency sensitive sensitivity to high. Yeah. And then it takes care of it. There are multiple bands, though, if you want to divide the applications and the demands of fast latency. Uh, if you have an application that needs a latency of less than 10 microseconds, if you have one of those high uh, uh, frequency trading applications where whether your computer is sitting on the first floor or second floor in the building makes a difference, and if it's on the first floor, you lose $10 million, we can't handle your load. Okay? We won't even try. If you have an application that uh, has tens of microseconds of latency demands, yeah, we can handle it. And you use the settings that we specify that takes care of it, both the mean and median and the jitter. What's interesting, again, this is a question of TLC on your part, is what happens if your latency demands are even uh, longer. So what if you can tolerate hundreds of microseconds of latency? Uh, or maybe a millisecond. So yeah, we can handle that. Obviously, if we can handle 10 microseconds, we can handle 100. The difference here is that to get that 10 microseconds, you basically have to take a core and reserve it for the VM. You say, I don't want anything else to run here because I want the VM to be able to get back and do its job immediately. I don't want to have to compete with other VMs. And your application, your, your customers, may not be willing to do that when your demands are only a millisecond versus somebody who needed tens of microseconds. So again, this is something that you need to figure out. You know, how much are you willing to do and are you willing to turn the knobs that are required to get this kind of a latency? So, summary, uh, these performance problems are very rare. These are corner cases. Um, but these are, you know, we try to be aware of them. We try to find them at VMware so you don't have to. Or if you do, we, we have already seen them. Uh, a lot of these applications, what they need is extra TLC. Virtualization is great. But for a demanding application, if you have a demanding application on a physical system, you don't just throw it on. You tune for it. You configure for it. You administer for it. Here, you have one more layer. You have to do that on the hypervisor, too. You have to apply best practices, you know, uh, to go to the latest uh, releases, et cetera. And there are some cases where that TLC is applying workarounds. Or changing the application. We, we like to think of virtualization. You just close your eyes, take the application, bring it on a, uh, on, a, uh, on a virtualized server, it works. Almost always. Sometimes you may have to change your application a little bit to get the right performance. And of course, we're going to continue working on uh, ESX, so we deal with these corner cases, but we're not quite there yet all the way. And uh, these are a large number of people whose work we stole to present here. So just acknowledging their work. And uh, that's it. And we'll be here to answer questions. But please, please fill out the surveys uh, so we get feedback from you to figure out how we can make this better. There's microphones there. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, we have a few more minutes. We can go over them. Thank you.